One of the many challenges of managing animals on rangeland are the many toxic plants that they encounter while foraging every day. So the, there are tremendous losses to animals that include death of animals. Uh, it could be abortion or, or other reproductive dysfunction or even just loss in production where animals are not quite as productive as they could be. It's estimated that over $500 million of livestock losses occur every year in the 17 Western states. So it's really important to understand the, the main principles of toxic plants. So we're going to talk about the categories of compounds, sort of the classes of compounds that are predominantly causing problems uh, for, lot, for range animals. And then each one of those classes have a slightly different management strategy to overcome and animals respond to those different classes of compounds differently. So those are the main uh, points that we're going to discuss today in integrated rangeland management. Now there's many ways that compounds and plants can negatively affect animals and they're on this continuum between what we would call anti-quality to real toxic agents. So anti-quality uh, compounds are ones that simply re resist digestion, things like lignin, silica, tannins. They're things that aren't digestible themselves and they may bind with nutrients to reduce digestibility. They're most common in grasses and basically all they do is they decrease the positive feedback from a plant. So they make plants less palatable and less digestible. Other ways that compounds can inhibit digestion is to actually kill rumen microbes. So plants like, or I mean compounds like essential oils in sagebrush or terpenes, they actually have antimicrobial um, a, uh, effects that uh, reduce and uh, kill microbes in the gut, which makes it so that animals can't digest those foods. Some compounds like tannins actually bind with protein, so they inhibit digestion in a slightly different way. And then finally, there's compounds that we would call toxic. And what is a toxic plant? So what are toxic plants? Well, my basic definition is plants that cause negative digestive or physiological effects. Mostly we think about toxic or poisonous plants as having really major identifiable physiological effects. But those can vary significantly. Could be death that would be the most obvious the uh, toxic plants that cause death also birth defects uh, those are called teratogenic effects uh, well, a good example of one up here in the pacific northwest is called crooked calf the disease and when sheep or cows eat lupin at a specific time during their gestation it can uh, it can freeze the joints of the their fetus and then calves or lambs will be born with kind of crooked legs ones that are turned back or their neck might be turned back so it fuses those joints and they'll be they'll be crooked it can be really significant some years uh, affect quite a few animals in a, a, a herd um, especially in eastern washington is a place where we have a lot of that trouble lots of other reproductive dysfunctions animals not being able to rebreed bloat there's a certain class of compounds that cause discomfort on the skin dermatitis or skin sores many ne neurological effects such as acting crazy, going around in circles, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do animals avoid toxic plants? They obviously have some mechanisms of avoiding toxic plants, otherwise they die. So animals have ways to determine and avoid toxic plants. And the key to this is that animals learn based on consequences. So essentially they learn to avoid toxic plants. There's two types of systems that animals use to avoid plants. One would be the skin defense system, the other is the gut defense system. Let's talk first about the skin defense system. It's quite simple. A, an animal touches a plant that has a thorn or a spine and it feels pain, such as if, if it might um, put its nose up against or its tongue up against one of these cactus plants and it would feel pain and it would draw back. It's the same as us um, hitting a, a hot stove or a, or a pin that, that we would automatically draw back. So it's definitely a, uh, a, a innate response. It's also important that when the animal touches the plant, it feels a pain right away. There are some plants that do affect the skin defense system, but have a delay such as uh, poison ivy that affects the skin defense system. And it may take minutes uh, or maybe hours before the skin is inflamed and causes pain. It's hard for animals to learn that link between the cause and the effect if it's long delayed. So that's a problem with this defense system. The, the closer the relationship between the, the, the experience, the touching and the pain, the better, the more easy it is for animals to learn. The second uh, defense system that animals use is the gut defense system. 
the gut defense system affects digestion. It works in a very different way than the skin defense system. So the animal eats a plant. It's important that they taste the plant because it's the taste that is linked to the feedback here. And then the animal, the animal digests the food a bit, and depending on what compounds are in it, it has some digestive feedback. If that feedback is good, like a boost in energy or um, a reduction in illness, it starts to feel better. If the animal has uh, feels better after eating a plant, they'll form a preference to that taste. If the food, however, makes the animal feel nauseous or, or the animal starts to feel worse, then, that, then the animal will form an aversion to the taste. So in other words, the um, animals can learn to avoid foods that uh, make them ill. Here's how that aversion based on consequences might work. If an animal encounters a new plant, they might smell it or, or taste it or see it. And the really important thing is that they eat and they taste it. They get some digestive feedback. And if that feedback is negative, they'll, that flavor will become distasteful. They won't like it. And when they encounter that plant in the future, they'll avoid it. It's that avoidance behavior that allows animals to avoid toxic plants in many cases. Of course, that can be broken down because uh, if your peers are eating it or if you have previous experience with a plant or the fact that just especially cattle and sheep because they're ruminants they have this natural propensity to try plants so you can break down that aversion but that it's that avoidance behavior that is based on aversions that allows animals to avoid toxic plants so why do plants make toxins anyway why do they invest in compounds that have these bad consequences I'm going to talk a lot about mammalian herbivores, but remember that most of the toxins in plants were actually antimicrobial. They were um, created by the uh, plant to avoid oh, rusts and bacteria and other microbes on their, in their, their system or on their leaves. Some of these compounds, whether they were designed for that or not, do have anti-herbivore effects. Uh, again, I'll talk about mammals, but insects are very important. Many of the compounds that we find in plants may have been created to get to um, to slow the impact of insects, even though they still have an effect on mammals. Um, and finally, some of the compounds are plant-plant interactions. Those are called allelopathic. So plants may create toxins or toxic compounds that uh, once they're shed onto the soil, they might slow competition from plants around the from neighboring plants. So they could be allelopathic. Finally, the last uh, but very important effect that some of these um, plant secondary compounds or toxins have is that they help the plant endure um, environmental extremes such as UV radiation, really low temperatures, or moisture stress. So we will talk about toxins as they affect mammal, mammalian animals and herbivores but they were probably created for some other mechanism in the, in the plant. So how do plants make toxins? I'm gonna to use this, and I already have used this term, secondary compounds. Primary metabolism contributes to growth and reproduction of the plant. So that's the growth of the plant and the production of seeds. Secondary metabolism is a whole set of metabolic pathways that do not lead to growth and reproduction. They yield toxins oftentimes. So that's why we call them secondary metabolites or secondary compounds, because they're not part of primary metabolism. They're part of mechanisms that are part of secondary metabolism. <laughs> Don't forget that um, some of the primary metabolites, such as nitrates, they're part of primary metabolism, but they can also be toxic in high doses. So most often, toxins are part of secondary metabolism, and that's why we call them secondary compounds. So how toxic is a plant? Well, it depends on a lot of characteristics, including characteristics of the plant and the environment. For example, it depends on phenological stage. Some plants are toxic when they're very young and others are toxic when they're late in flowering and producing seeds. Uh, tall larkspur is a plant that's very toxic and it's uh, most toxic right as it starts to produce seeds and flowers. After it produces those flowers and seeds, then it's less toxic or well before that, it's not as toxic. It can be affected by the nutrient levels, especially nitrate accumulating plants. Uh, it would be an example of plants that are more toxic on some sites than others. Weather, there's a whole series of plants that are fine all the time, and then all of a sudden there'll be a frost, uh, and that will make compounds in the plant form toxic compounds. 
another would be heat. Some, some plants, as they get hot and dry, they'll become toxic. Environmental stress, such as drought, again, as plants are stressed, they may become toxic. And then plant parts. Uh, the where, how toxic a plant is may depend on whether you're measuring the stems or the seeds or the roots or other parts of the plant. Toxicity also depends on the animal. Remember that the poison depends on the dose. Many compounds eaten in small amounts could be healthy. They, medicines, for example, are often plant toxins that if eaten in small amounts, they can be beneficial. But if, if, if too much is eaten, then they are toxic. Salt is an interesting one because we all need salt. All mammals need salt, but eaten in too high a quantity, salt is deadly. Um, mammal species is important because different species have different rumen microbes, different liver activities, and different cellular enzymes. For example, cattle uh, and sheep differ. There are many plants such as tall larkspur that are not very toxic at all to sheep, but highly toxic to cattle. On the other hand, we'll talk about oxalates, which are highly toxic to sheep and not very toxic to cattle. It also depends on what other plants were in the diet. There are some times where two toxic compounds will... Um, be in combinations and they'll they'll kind of invalidate each other's effects and this is a case where tannins for example which i mentioned that they bind with proteins they can also bind with toxic plant comp compounds hormonal state can also be important there are some compounds that are toxic to pregnant females but not to open females and then body condition i did some really interesting with um uh, with uh, lupins and both sheep and cattle and uh, Cattle and sheep that are in good condition are much more able to withstand the negative effects of lupins. So we're going to talk about a whole uh, series of classes of compounds, toxic agents in plants. We'll talk about alkaloids, glycosides, nitrates, soluble oxalates, tannins, essential oils, um, compounds that cause photosensitization, and also compounds that cause dermatitis. So I'm just going to go through these groups one at a time, and they uh, will give examples um, of how animals avoid these plants and what we can do for management. We're going to start with alkaloids because they're some of the most powerful toxic plant substances that we deal with. These are going to sound pretty familiar. Things like caffeine, morphine, codeine, heroin, cocaine. Those are all alkaloids. They're water soluble. They are effective in fairly small quantities and they have some characteristics that make them dangerous such as they remain toxic even after the plant matures or freezes. The real linchpin and the whole reason that alkaloids are so um, effective is because they're effective in small quantities and they affect the nervous system. They cause nervous disorders, shakiness. Uh, there's a plant called crazy weed makes the animal be crazy and sort of go around in circles. And that's dangerous because this negative reinforcement is part of the skin defense system. So it's hard for animals to learn to avoid something they ate that makes them fidgety or, or nervous several hours later. Uh, so the, the skin defense system is really not very effective for compounds like this where there's a long delay between eating and the effect. And uh, it's because they, are, they don't actually make the animals sick unless they're eaten in very large quantities, they usually don't cause nauseousness. And the gut defense system requires nauseous feedback. So again, alkaloids are effective because they are effective in small quantities. They affect the nervous system the nervous the skin defense system so they are hard for the animal to learn to avoid so let's take a look at a few plants that contain alkaloids lupins and loco weeds um, there's many different kinds of loco weeds and lupins and they contain alkaloids they're often not deadly because animals can learn to avoid them or they have to be eaten in fairly high quantities but they definitely can cause negative effects such as loco weeds those are crazy weeds and the animal, if they eat too much, they'll just go around in circles and they'll look crazy and shaky. So they can be deadly. Um, they also, as I mentioned before, some lupins, for example, cause birth defects. The one that's most challenging for livestock producers on Western lands is our larkspurs. Tall larkspur, for example, is the plant that causes more livestock deaths than any other toxic plant in Western North America. So they can be quite deadly. If animals eat those plants, they can die. Uh, quite quickly, uh, their um, nervous system just takes over and they can't breathe or 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 circulate blood, so they die. Uh, the, also, tall larkspur is interesting because it has these big leafy leaves, so animals are attracted to that leaf. Other plants, uh, bitterweeds in the in the southwest, we have bitterweed uh, plants that can cause death. 
You probably know about poison hemlock or water hemlock. They're both very deadly. Um, they can cause significant deaths. Again, animals will eat them and their system will just shut down. Glycosides is another group of compounds that are common in range plants, in, in some range plants anyway. They naturally occur in many plants and forages. Their action on the animals is that they block the transport of oxygen and release in the blood. So the animal essentially uh, suffocates to death because the oxygen is not um, transported in its blood. They can be highly toxic, causing death. They don't usually provide negative post-ingestive feedback, so it's hard for animals to learn to avoid them. And they vary highly in time and space. So glycosides may be either in a plant and not in a toxic form. And then, for example, it might freeze or get really hot and they'll be they'll change into the toxic form. So careful management to prevent high ingestion levels is really important. As I mentioned, uh, one of the really dangerous things about glycosides is that they can change a lot depending on environmental conditions. So one example is Johnson grass. There aren't many toxins in Johnson grass, but Johnson grass can um, have compounds in it that become toxic. So prussic acid that could have this cyanogenic effect if the plant gets stressed by freezing or by heat. So a plant could, like Johnson grass could be fine all the time and then some environmental change happens and the plant becomes toxic. The next three on this list, choke cherry, mountain mahogany, and serviceberry, also have that same characteristic. They're interestingly all members of the Rosaceae family. So many members of that family have this uh, glycosides in them, cyanogenic glycosides. And uh, in fact, there is uh, an old lore that in Egyptian and Roman area, the, the way that they would um, punish some people is they would give them what they called the penalty of the peach. And a peach is also a member of the Rosaceae, and they would harvest peaches, they would chomp up the seeds, grind them up, and give them, uh, feed them to people, or, uh, you know, give them forcefully to people, and the people would die. So that penalty of the peach was uh, those cyanogenic compounds inside the fruit of, uh, inside the seed of fruits from the Rosaceae family. So it's nothing to, uh, to be light about, but we don't usually have big problems with uh, these plants with livestock. Those, if you do any, if you know anything about wildlife management, choke cherry, mountain mahogany, serviceberry are very important plants for wildlife. And the way that they get by is just that they're not toxic very often. Some other compounds, of plants such as in the desert, desert southwest, uh, burr buttercup is common. Uh, one plant that we have trouble with is white clover. When it's grown in hay fields, it can go, it can become toxic again, just because of environmental conditions. Nitrites are also a problem because they can accumulate in plants. So if you have situations like high nitrogen soil, drought, low light conditions, or if you have treatment with some herbicides such as 2,4-D, plants can accumulate nitrogens, nitrogen, and then nitrogen uh, changes to nitrates in the in the animal's body and it, um, I'm sorry, it, it goes from nitrate to nitrite, which blocks the ability of blood to carry oxygen. So the animal again suffocates. Um, it doesn't usually cause illness or aversion. And that's another reason that nitrates are challenging to manage for because environmental conditions can change them and the animal has a hard time learning that the, that food is making them sick because they don't make, because the food doesn't make them sick. Plants that contain nitrates would be things such as Russian thistle, silver nightshade. Those are uh, both plants that we often find in the desert southwest. Kochia, careless weed, um, many of these are members of the kinopode family. So kinopodes often have this characteristic of accumulating nitrates. Another class of compounds that affect animals on rangelands are oxalates. Uh, oxalates occur pretty commonly through in plants that are in the salt desert uh, shrub communities. They have a un unique cat, um, mechanism where they chelate with cations and they, especially calcium. So they form these complexes with um, compounds like calcium and they form insoluble um, crystallized salts. And what that, what those salts, crystallized salts do is that they d cause damage to vessels, um, blood and um, urinary vessels, just any t transport in the animal's body. So death can be quite quick or it can be delayed for several hours. The reason it's of interest is because it's mostly toxic to sheep and there have been catastrophic losses of sheep uh, across the Great Basin. Wells, Nevada in 1942, one of the first losses recorded was 160 sheep. But even as late as um, 
1971, the picture there is 1,250 sheep that died from overingestion of halogenin, which is a oxalate com um, containing plant. So uh, this is the reason that uh, we, we do study oxalates because they can be really deadly. Interestingly, they're much more deadly to sheep than cattle. Occasionally you'll hear about problems with cattle, but not very often. Many plants in the salt desert do contain oxalates. They can be highly variable from just a few percentage to up to 30% of the biomass of a plant being uh, contained, being composed of oxalates. Some of the ones that are most dangerous, uh, what we mentioned before is halogeton. It's a plant that has caused many of these large losses of sheep across the West. It's just a slow growing annual plant that um, is, was introduced to the Great Basin, but it uh, is found commonly throughout the basin, especially in disturbed sites. Greasewood is also a plant that can accumulate oxalate, and it's a native shrub that's found in the Great Basin. Now we'll switch gears a little bit to plants, compounds that are, are common in plants, but it takes a lot to cause damage. So these are often called quantitative um, toxic compounds. And the first among those is tannins. What tannins do is they reduce protein digestion. And so they don't usually cause nausea leading to aversions unless they're eaten in very high qualities or i'm sorry very high quantities um this ter term might be familiar to you uh, we talk about tanning hides so uh originally when they tanned hides they took tannins from plants and they rubbed them on the on a hide and because of that characteristic of reducing digestion it, it was a way to tan the hide and keep it from being um, de degraded by bacteria etc so that's where that word tannin might sound familiar to you uh, what tannins do is they decrease weight because they do grab onto these proteins in the gut. Usually it's proteins of the other forages, other plants in the gut, but it can even be the gut tissue itself can get hardened by tannins. They're lethal in very high qualities, but this is not very common. One example or one exception is oak poisoning. For some reason, there are some very volatile compounds or uh, libel compounds uh, in oak tannins that can create death in animals. So some plants that contain tannins would include oak brushes. Most oak do. And if you've ever collected acorns, you, you will, uh, if you break them open with your hands, you'll know that your thumbs kind of get black and you'll see that tanning effect. Black brush, which is a, a plant common in the southwest, uh, southern Utah area, it is called black brush because it does turn black with tannins. Mule's ear is another plant. If you've ever tried to collect it and take it home, it has a very strong smell. And if it sits for a while, it just turns black. So those beautiful leaves will just turn black. So all of those are plants that contain tannins. Essential oils or terpenes are also common in rangeland plants and it takes very high quantities to cause um, death in animals, but they can cause a lot of um, problems for digestion. Well, they're called essential because they have an essence. They, the, they, these terpenes give a plant a distinctive odor. For example, that the smell of sage or the smell of pine, those are essential oils that you're smelling. They, what their main effect in animals is they kill rumen microbes. They kill microbes. So h historically for, for decades, uh, we've, people have used pine and put it into solutions to get rid of bacteria in their houses or in manufacturing or in their environment. So that pine sol effect is created by those terpenes in the pine plant. If an animal eats too many of those terpenes, uh, then they can kill rumen microbes and kind of shut the gut down so that uh, the animal might lose weight because it's not digesting very effectively. They do cause illness and nausea, but usually at very high quantities. And the most common thing we see with the consumption of terpenes is just weight loss again, because digestion can be compromised so they are lethal in very high quantities, but it doesn't, we don't hear about it very much because it takes very high quantities. Some plants that contain essential oils are plants like sagebrush, juniper, and pine. And again, if you take those plants and you crush up those leaves, they have a very distinctive odor, and that odor is from the essential oils. Uh, so they uh, are common throughout the West. Um, another interesting thing about essential oils is they tend to be quite flammable. So we think of sagebrush. Um, as being a plant that isn't very well adapted to fire, and yet once fire starts on it, it, it will kind of almost explode because of those terpenes in the plant. They're quite flammable. There's a whole series of compounds that cause 
photosensitization or sensitivity to sunlight. Uh, they cause they can do things such as causing swelling in the head and the ears. There's a, a, a disease or a condition called big head in sheep. If sheep eat, sheep eat too much of some of these compounds, their, their head will swell up. It can cause swelling of the skin and sloughing of the skin when it's exposed to the sun. What actually happens is that the uh, most of the death or the problems with, on livestock in the West are created because the, these compounds cause damage to the liver. They prevent the liver from breaking down certain compounds. So, for example, they, there's an accumulation of uh, when chlorophyll is, goes into the gut, it is uh, converted to another compound, um, chlorethylene, and if that accumulates, it is transported to the skin, and then it becomes photodynamic. So the, that chlorophyll-like compound, again, collects sun, and that's the, that collection or photodynamic state is what causes the uh, the animal to get sunburned. So oddly enough, it's mostly the fact that these photosensitive com compounds make the liver less effective, that the compounds then go to the skin and cause this photosensitization. It can cause death in very high compounds. It does not usually cause illness, so it is hard for animals to learn through conditioned diversions to avoid these photosensitive plants. And there's a long delay between eating the food and then feeling the photosensitivity. Couple plants that are important in causing photosensitization are St. John's wort. Uh, that's an interesting one because it affects horses more than others. So people are often quite concerned about St. John's wort in horse pastures because animals, horses, can become quite photosensitized when they eat that plant. Horsebrush is a plant that I mentioned that causes big head in sheep. So I've seen this happen myself where sheep will eat this horsebrush and they can get, they cause have a swelling of the head. In this plant it does re-sprout after fire, so when a fire goes through, all the sagebrush may be removed, and some of the first plants that come back might be horsebrush, and that's where we tend to have some problems with animals eating horsebrush because there's no other shrubs available after fire. A variety of dermatitis conditions can also be created when animals eat plants. You're probably familiar with this, like poison ivy. It's the toxins that are poisonous upon contact. So they don't even have to go through the system. They affect the skin defense system. So they cause pain. Animals avoid them. They're rarely lethal, but they certainly can cause significant um, production losses and really cause a lot of discomfort in animals. A few of the plants that we would uh, attribute to ha having severe dermatitis effects would be poison ivy, poison sumac, and poison oak. And these are effective on nearly any mammal that comes in contact with them. Okay, so those are some of the, comp the plant compounds that cause problems in uh, livestock management or wildlife habitat in the West. What can you do about it? How can you help animals avoid being poisoned? Well, the first thing is to make sure to provide adequate supply of good forage. We don't usually have problems with poisonous plants if there's plenty of uh, forage alternatives. Make sure to provide salt and minerals. Um, because those can be uh, compounds that help animals deal with toxins. Don't put hungry animals in pastures with abundant toxic plants. Those uh, massive die-offs of sheep that I uh, showed pictures of earlier, those were caused when hungry animals were put in pastures with abundant halogen. So be careful with animals when you're moving them and the pasture that they're moved to if they're hungry. So be careful to introduce animals to new pastures that might have new foods in, in them. Do it when animals are in, a, in good body condition and slowly so they really can, um, can learn about plants. Be aware of conditions that create toxic plants and where, where those toxic plants are located in your pastures. Uh, remember that some plants can be fine nearly all the time and then you might have something like a freezing event or, or drought event that those plants might start to be toxic. So if you've got some of those plants, especially those that create nitrate, you need to pay attention to when they might be toxic or not. Other ways to prevent animal poisoning is continue consider removing animals from pastures when they have been treated with herbicides. Remember that 2,4-D was an herbicide that causes plants to accumulate it causes some plants to accumulate nitrates. Um, grazing pastures in seasons when poisonous plants are least toxic. This is a challenge throughout the West that um, when anim, when um, Grazing permits, especially on Forest Service higher elevation lands, are set. They don't always continue, consider the poisonous plants issues. And as I mentioned, uh, tall larkspur 
is a plant that that cattlemen really want to be off of right when it starts to produce seeds so that there's a an issue with um be when a pasture can be grazed on a grazing permit and when it can be grazed in terms of toxicity so preventing introducing toxic plants or trying to control toxic plants is important and then always using the correct animal species uh, historically there was a condition where sheep would move through areas with a lot of tall larkspur because they like tall larkspur they remove it from the pasture and it's not very toxic to them and then behind them would come cattle who like grass more and are affected strongly by tall larkspur but if it has already been moved by the sheep they can tend to um, can can travel through that system so it's a multi-species grazing situation that was used historically throughout the west to reduce the loss of cattle to tall larkspur it hasn't been used so much lately but is i still hear of it in, at certain times so there's some really broad overview of toxic range plants some things to remember are look for plants that that vary significantly depending on environmental conditions also be aware of plants that animals can learn to avoid through uh, the gut defense system because the plants make them ill versus those that they cannot learn to avoid such as larkspur or um, or lupins because those plants do not make the animal ill those are really dangerous situations and also be aware of plants that are toxic in very small quantities that's when we tend to have the most problem with animals eating toxic plants and dying or losing production from them so those are some of the main factors to keep in mind